Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Issachar Foundation Jamaica Public Lecture Series. My name is Philippa Davies, again, I'm a member of the Issachar Foundation Jamaica and the moderator for this evening's lecture. Welcome wherever you are located, whether in Jamaica, other Caribbean territories or other parts of the world. A special welcome to this evening's lecture, Weed in the Family Tree, the Generational Impact of Ganja on the Brain. Now, if this is your first Issachar Foundation lecture, special welcome to you. We hope that it will not be the last. This lecture series provides a discussion forum to explore public policy issues and social trends within the context of the Judeo-Christian worldview, which the foundation unabashedly affirms as providing the most sound foundation for nation building and human flourishing for everyone. And we take our inspiration from the word of God, particularly from 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, which says, the men of Issachar understood times and knew what Israel should do. And now I'm going to invite the chairman of Issachar Foundation Jamaica, Dr. Wayne West, to bring his opening remarks and to open our time together in prayer. Dr. West, the floor is uh, yours. Th thank you very much, Philippa. Um, we open in prayer first. Uh, just uh, come along with me. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your great wisdom that you are a God of order, that you took chaos and made it into order uh, in, in a process that covered six days and that you have laid out how we ought to function and how to be consistent with your word in order to flourish as a species and as sentient beings on this good planet that you've given us. So we thank you that we have the opportunity to share with our neighbors as members of Issaka Foundation on what you would want us to do and how you would want us to live so that we can have the best lives possible uh, in between our birth and our death. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the Issachar Foundation is based on the principle uh, that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the earth is in fact created by a sentient being who is absolutely intelligent, who has prince, who has a character, who uh, because of his character has a certain moral and ethical values. And who has designed the universe so that its component parts work together for the good. Uh, and that is basically the biblical worldview. And uh, the Issachar Foundation seeks to analyze all public policy and law from the perspective of the biblical worldview and to advocate for the biblical worldview in the public square because it is the only worldview that will allow human beings to be the best they can be. Uh, so we have a lecture series and uh, Ms. Davis, Philippa Davis, will tell you a bit more about it. And, the, and then we'll proceed to today's lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. West. And welcome to those who have joined since we opened the meeting room. We're so glad that you could join us for another in the series, public lecture series hosted by the Issachar Foundation Jamaica. Now we've been hosting public lectures since August, 2010. And before COVID-19, we met face to face, but since June, 2020, we've migrated online. And this is actually our 11th virtual lecture. And some of the previous topics over the years have been moral inputs, mortal outcomes, bridging the gap between values and crime, uncovering the hidden facts about NIDS, the national ID system, life with COVID, health, law, and liberty, common sense for the commonwealth, resisting British totalitarianism, combating state corruption 101, and George Soros globalism and a threat to human rights. Now, if you'd like to be added to our mailing list to receive notification of future lectures, please inbox me in the chat on the Zoom platform. Philippa Davies is the name. Just put your email address and I will add you to our mailing list. Now, just to let you know that after our presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. We will take written questions. You can also put them into the chat, the general chat, or inbox me directly, and I will feed them to our speaker. Please make sure that your mics remain muted throughout the lecture. And I also invite you to visit the Issachar Foundation Jamaica YouTube channel, 
where you can view and listen to past lectures. And so now this evening on our topic, Weeding the Family, the Generational Impact of Ganja on the Brain. I'm pleased to have, we are pleased to have Dr. Yasmin Hurd, who is the director of the Addiction Institute within the Mount Sinai Behavioral Health System, as well as the Ward Coleman Chair of Translational Neuroscience and Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, USA. Dr. Hurd is an internationally renowned neuroscientist whose translational research examines the neurobiology of drug abuse and related psychiatric disorders. Using multidisciplinary approaches, her research has provided unique insights into the impact of developmental cannabis exposure on the brain and epigenetic mechanisms that underline the drug's long lasting effects into adulthood, even across generations. Dr. Hurd's basic science research is complemented by pioneering human clinical investigations, evaluating the therapeutic potential of novel science-based strategies, such as cannabidiol for the treatment of opioid, opioid addiction and related psychiatric disorders. Based on her high impact research and her advocacy of drug addiction education and health, Dr. Hurd was inducted into both the National Academy of Medicine and the National, National Academy of Science, a very rare accomplishment. And this is particularly worthy of celebration by us this evening because Dr. Yasmin Hurd is Jamaican, Jamaican born. So we're so pleased to have one of our own presenting to us on this very intriguing topic on weed in the family, the generational impact of ganja on the brain. Welcome, Dr. Yasmin Hurd, and the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Philippa. And it's uh, it's definitely great being here on this day, especially it's this, this day is my mother's birthday. And so uh, I- Happy birthday to her. her. You know, unfortunately, she passed away a number of years oh. ago. It's very special for me. So it brings Jamaica in for me even more. Let me share my slides and um, okay. And so um, can you see this the slide? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, I actually appreciated this title. This title is uh, very um, provocative. And for me, as Felipe mentioned, I have been studying the developmental effects of, of, of cannabis. So, you know, saying ganja is not so familiar anymore in the US because we say, I, I mean, the street lingo is marijuana and I say cannabis, but um, just get this started. But when you talk about the family tree and the generational impact of cannabis on the brain, for me, it is about the developing brain, um, the long-term effects um, throughout life and across generations. And, you know, just like in the US, I know in Jamaica, you know, um, this whole debate on cannabis from the recreational um, use to the medicinal potential has gone on for a while. And, you know, everybody, when they hear that I'm Jamaican, they're like, oh, you know, um, you must smoke marijuana. And I said that I don't, it's not that everybody in Jamaica smokes ganja. And this is the thing in terms of, of course, you know, when we think about um, cannabis and, you know, this, this, this pendulum swinging back and forth, where is the science behind it is what my work has been about. So I want to start with some fundamentals and definitely I'm going to talk a, a number of scientific things. Don't worry. You know, science is about a new language. And so we can talk in regular language in the, the, when, when it, the question answer period. But I want to start with some fundamentals, like I said, in terms of what's cannabis. And you know, for the recreational use of cannabis, the cannabinoid in the plant that is associated with the euphoria, the high, why people take it recreationally, is THC. And that plant-derived um, uh, cannabinoid, THC, it binds to receptors in our body um, that are distributed throughout our body, and it's they're called. Um, the cannabinoid um, receptor, uh, there are two types of cannabinoid receptors called CB1 and CB2, and they're expressed, like I said, in the brain and throughout the body in many organs. 
the cannabinoid receptor one is the most abundant um, receptor in our brain. Um, I think every time someone comes in, I'm gonna have to do this, uh, it keeps going. But the, those, endo, those cannabinoid receptors, they're not there for cannabis, for THC. They're there because they modulate the actions of our natural endocannabinoids. And these natural endocannabinoids are these lipids, these fats, these precursors. And there are a number of them. And these, these endocannabinoids, as I said, bind to the receptors. And the cannabinoid receptor, that CB1 receptor that I told you about, that's throughout the body, also the CB2s throughout the body, especially in the immune system, but in the brain, the most predominant um, receptor is the CB1 receptor. In fact, it's the most abundant um, receptor that we have on the surfaces of our cells. And it's not there to smoke cannabis. It's there to regulate how cells speak to each other. It plays a really critical role in what we call synaptic communication, synaptic plasticity. And because of that, when we have THC that binds to these receptors, it changes how our natural endocannabinoid um, transmitters, modulators actually work. Now, the reason why this for me has been an interesting and important question comes back to the developing brain because our endogenous endocannabinoid system, not only are they the key target for cannabis, but these, um, the cannabinoid receptors and these, um, the endogenous ligands and the enzymes that make them and, and break them down, they're very dynamic during the developing brain. In fact, they're really critical for many of the developmental processes that occur during development. So the fetal brain, it's, it's really critical that the endocannabinoid system um, has a normal processing in order to have all of these developmental processes um, uh, function normally. Now, again, since the endocannabinoid system plays a critical role in the developing brain, the, the question that we have seen or the, the reason why it's so important is that we know more than ever, at least in the US, I don't know what the numbers are in, in Jamaica, is that many um, pregnant women and especially young women of reproductive age are using cannabis more than ever before even like 15 to 28% of, of women who are pregnant, especially younger ones in urban and impoverished communities are using more and more cannabis. They're also breastfeeding with cannabis. And we see in the US that there is more indoor cannabis um, smoking. But it's not just during fetal development and infancy and childhood that the endo, our endogenous cannabinoid system plays an important role, but even during adolescence and into adulthood, when that final maturation of the cortex takes place. And that's a time period during adolescence and young adulthood when many young people naturally experiment. And this is one of the drugs, cannabis, that they experiment often with. So I'm gonna take you through um, what we know from looking at the developmental um, effects of cannabis from like fetal, adolescence, and cross-generational. So we, no, as I said, that the endocannabinoid system is really critical for um, the, the neuronal development, but it's actually very critical during early stages for the hard wiring of the brain, meaning those pathways, those cells, the, the networks that they make, the endocannabinoid systems are really critical. In fact, when we can look in the human fetal brain, we can see that um, in maternal use of cannabis can impact on these proteins that are so important for um, the sort of skeletal organization, the laying down of these, of these proteins, that is really, really critical for, um, for the, like I said, the organization of the developing brain. And in many different brain regions that we see it, I'm not gonna go into like the specific brain regions, as I said, in terms of the actual scientific region is not important but we see that it also impacts on our endogenous opioid system. And the opioid system plays a critical role, not only in reward, but emotional regulation, stress, and pain. We also see that it plays, an, uh, it impacts when, when um, fetuses are exposed to cannabis in utero, it also impacts on the dopaminergic system. And the dopamine system, again, another transmitter system important for reward, goal-directed behavior, motor function. 
And where we see these changes occur, for example, a, a brain region that's really important for, um, as it said, emotional regulation, this nucleus accumbens, the striatum, we see that there's significant reduction there. We can see it in other brain regions, another region called the amygdala, that's really important for emotional regulation. And importantly, even here during um, fetal development, we can see sex differences where the, the boys are, have, show a much stronger effect on their dopaminergic system than the females in relation to their mother's cannabis use. But when we study um, people, obviously it's very complicated because sometimes the women may take other drugs like you know, smoking cigarettes. And we, the question that we want to know or we want to answer is, what are the long-term consequences on the brain? So does this last in throughout lifetime? And that's why we have animal models where we can really say, is there a causal effect on the brain for prenatal cannabis exposure? And I will just say, you know, when we look at our animal models that were exposed prenatally to THC, we can see many similar molecular changes in the brains at the same developmental prenatal time period as we studied in the human. And importantly, we can see that these changes actually last into adulthood because then we can study the animals into adulthood. And we can even see that the, the functional activity, the firing of their cells differ. But you know, for me, a big question still is, even though animal models allow us to look into adulthood, we can start to still see, are there any impact on the, the offspring and the family in part during early life in humans? And I have a really um, amazing colleague, Dr. Yoko Namora, who had been studying stress, like, you know, the environmental stress is a really important fact that many pregnant women and obviously everybody goes through an experience, but during pregnancy that's, you know, has significant implications. And we're looking at also cannabis exposure during pregnancy. But one of the things is that every pregnant woman might have different stressors. But one thing happened for us in our project and all of New York and the Northeast and in Jamaica, you guys, have, you know, hurricanes are more common in the Caribbean. But in New York, we were very surprised in 2012 when the hurricane Superstorm Sandy, you can see a lot of Manhattan is flooded and it caused a huge stress. But we had been studying the women and their kids before, and then we could study during and after. And to get an insight into perhaps what their children, and we've been following their children ever since, um, what they might've experienced, we looked in the placenta. And what people don't realize is that, well, I think you know, most pregnant women and obviously um, doctors and uh, midwives know that the placenta is really a critical temporary organ that is not only, um, it's essential for fetal development, but we know that in one way, we always, we call it sometimes the third brain because it's the link between the, the fetus and the mother's brain. But also programming of the, of the placenta is really essential for um, not just healthy neurodevelopment, but when you have aberrations of it, it can even be associated with psychiatric risk. And when we look in the placenta of women who had used cannabis while pregnant, we could see, for example, the gene that expresses the, the, the cannabinoid receptor was significantly reduced in the placenta. And it correlated to the amount of cannabis the mothers reported using. And when in the brain, people have seen with neuroimaging that the cannabinoid receptor actually is reduced in people who use cannabis. So the cannabinoid receptor is turned down in part, becomes tolerant. But when we looked overall to just try to get an idea of, you know, of the thousands of genes that are changed, the thing that was really interesting was that what's changed with, within the placenta with the mother's cannabis use is our genes related to the immune system. No matter what level and how we look at it, immune dysregulation was there in um, the placenta of the women who use, who use cannabis. We could see this even in our animal models. So we know that it's THC that's inducing these changes in the placenta. And again, we could see that the, the placenta of boys were much more significantly changed. And especially these immune related genes were changed to a much greater extent in the boys than in the, than in the females. 
but does that have any impact on the outcome of these children's lives and the family? So like I said, we bring the children in practically every year and they see um, clinicians and we can see one thing already and I'll show a few things that, for example, um, when their children, like three to four years old, we can see this as their stress hormone levels are much higher in the hair, for example, of these kids that had maternal exposure to, to pre, prenatally to cannabis. We also see clinical behavioral differences in these kids. For example, increased aggression, increased anxiety, increased hyperactivity. When we put it all together, um, it's clear that from both our, our human study and our animal work that prenatal exposure to cannabis here and THC, you can see that there's a significant reorganization of the, the gene network in the placenta. And you can see ch changes in their kids, for example, that are associated with increased stress reactivity, increased anxiety. And we can see that this, interestingly, the correlation between um, the placental changes, we could look at what are the patterns that happen in the placenta and did they predict anything in the children? And the one thing that they predicted were the immune related genes, these cytokine related genes correlated with the children's anxiety. And it was only in the mothers that use cannabis, not in the control group. But an important thing I do wanna emphasize, we do see these important effects of cannabis, but the environment also to stress made a difference. So that you have this double hit that the combination of maternal stress and cannabis use during pregnancy actually made the anxiety dis, um, uh, behavioral changes in their children to a, increase to a much greater extent, both in anxiety and aggression. We can see that also this synergistic effect, this double hit, that if they had both prenatal cannabis and prenatal stress, like the expression of their, um, their stress receptor gene was changed to a much greater extent. And the same thing, their cannabinoid receptor gene was also changed to a much greater extent with double hit. So in studying the kids and doing this longitudinal study, we know that we can see from very early on that the in utero environment with cannabis did associate with the children's behavior. So again, like I said, we wanna make sure, is this really related to THC? And even though we can study the children of the kids, we, can, we won't be able to study them into adulthood, at least not for now. So that's where we use our animal model. And we can see in our animal model that Yes, there are long-term consequences of this prenatal THC exposure. They show changes in motivation here. Um, these animals pressing for like a, cho a chocolate, so they press a lever to receive one chocolate um, pellet. And they have to press more and more each time to get one. And these adult animals with prenatal THC only, they would press the lever like a hundred times just to get one chocolate that, um, pellet. They also show greater depression-like behavior, and they also show greater changes in their hedonic state, especially when they're stressed. So the question for us is, what is really maintaining these molecular and these behavioral changes as a consequence of this in utero cannabis and THC exposure across life? And that's where we then started looking at different molecular mechanisms. And a particular mechanism that's really important is called epigenetics. And epigenetics is, is, an, is an important biological process because it allows the, you know, we inherit our DNA sequence from our parents. So that's genetics and that's the blueprint. But epigenetic mechanisms allow the environment to actually control, there's, to actually control how the genes are turned on or off. So they can override even some of the genetic things that happen in our lives. And that's how the environment can make this uh, have such a huge impact. There are many, many different epigenetic mechanisms. I'm not gonna go you know, through them in, you know, for you guys, but they tell us that you know, on our DNA, 
there are tags that can be put on our, DNA, on our DNA, like I said, to turn genes on and off. And there are even these small microRNAs that can change proteins. And when we studied the brains um, uh, of end of placenta of, of um, adults and, and fetuses with cannabis or prenatal um, THC exposure, we see that there are these epigenetic changes. And we know these epigenetic changes are specific to behavior because we can modulate these behavior, modulate these epigenetic mechanisms and change their, normalize their behavior. But an important thing that I wanna emphasize to, to you is that actually these epigenetic changes also reorganize immune related genes in the brain. So not only do you see these immune and stress related behaviors in the offspring, you also see that um, normally the, the, where these epigenetic tags are put on the DNA in these genes, there's not a big relationship in normal animals, vehicle animals. But in those that had prenatal THC, there's a complete reorganization where these epigenetic tags are, are enriched in these immune related genes. So that's prenatal. Adolescence, as I said, is a, a very um, important time period for the final maturation of our brains, especially in synaptic pruning and fine tuning out how the neural circuits communicate. The, this time period we know, you know, as I said, is a time period where you know, teens experiment and so on, and the drug that they experiment with often is cannabis. And one of the things that we know is that a study done in Europe, in many countries in Europe, has seen that the increased odds, the risk of psychotic disorders has increased with the amount of THC potency over the years. And we know that this also associates with um, having, um, developing a cannabis use disorder and other disorders as, as well. But interestingly, over the past few years in the US at least, we've seen actually decrease in drug use in adolescents for most drugs, but not for cannabis. And in fact, many teens even will meet a, a psychiatric disorder of a cannabis use disorder. In fact, many people think, you know, before that you couldn't develop addiction to, to cannabis, but cannabis use disorder is a clinical diagnosis and about 30% of people who use cannabis um, will develop uh, a cannabis use disorder. And we know also that it has a strong comorbidity with other psychiatric disorders, for example, anxiety, the irony is that our, our patients with cannabis use disorder often tell us that they use cannabis to treat their anxiety, but we can see that the more they use cannabis, the worse their anxiety gets. And cannabis use disorder we see in the brain changes, um, induces neurobiological changes very similar to what we see in other drugs. So in brain areas such as the cortex, the prefrontal cortex that really mediates decision-making and reward value, are changed in the same way that we see with, with other substances of abuse. So as I mentioned, you know, genetics is really important and the environment can change um, some aspects of, of how genetics play to your, our vulnerability. But we can see with cannabis is that genetics does play a role. So for example, a genetic variant that is linked to anxiety and neuroticism in cannabis users, we can see that their individuals may try cannabis and don't develop a cannabis use disorder. And those that have the high anxiety, they develop um, a little increased odds of getting a cannabis use disorder. But those that have both the genetic risk and high anxiety behavioral traits, they are at much greater risk of developing a cannabis use disorder. Even if you know, others may not have the genetic risk, they don't develop as strong a cannabis use disorder. So genetics does play a role. So going back to adolescence. So when we look in the prefrontal cortex, like I said, that last part of our brain to reach full maturity, we can even see in our animal models that adults that had adolescent THC exposure, the structure of their cortical cells differ. They're not as complex. And when your cells are, are not as complex, they're not communicating with each other as they would normally. And interestingly, the morphological changes, these structural changes that we see are very similar to what we see with chronic stress. But one of the things that we could do is that we could pick up these cells using a laser 
And picking up these cells, we can then sequence them to see what is the molecular makeup that THC is doing to these cortical cells. And we were really shocked to see that there is a really strong reprogramming of the cortex in these neurons in adults that had adolescent THC exposure. In fact, there was only about a 5% overlap of the genes that occur during normal developing adolescent brain and with THC. And where those occurred related once again to the structure of cells and to epigenetic mechanisms. So these epigenetic mechanisms were significantly impacted by the adolescent THC exposure. So what then, you know, as I mentioned earlier that we see, you know, many people say they take cannabis, ganja, um, you know, to alleviate their anxiety or so on. And many people tell us, you know, oh, but we're just, you know, we're using a natural drug that, you know, we have a natural cannabis system, a natural endocannabinoid system. And that is true. We do have a natural endocannabinoid system, like I showed you earlier, but cannabis completely hijacks that. It completely um, overwhelms this and it overwhelms it as the potency of THC has gone up. These receptors are more and more impacted. And so they actually now start to shut down our natural endogenous cannabinoid system. The thing that we see with the high potency THC is that you know in the 60s or, or so, 70s, 80s, 90s, you had about two to 4% THC in the cannabis plant. Today it's 14 to 24%. And even some formulations and some ways in which kids use, young people use cannabis today, it's even over 70% THC. It's a completely different drug. So what does potency mean? So one of the things that we see, again, is that potency makes a difference even to our stress hormones. So like 90 days after um, getting high potency THC, the stress hormone levels are still elevated. And we know that these stress hormones can actually impact once again on the immune system. And that's indeed what we see, that the immune gene, when it's stressed, is significantly changed in, in those that had um, adolescent THC exposure. And when we look in their brains, we see that there are significant changes in certain cells that are really important to synaptic plasticity, but also even immune function. And the, the decision-making cognitive function directly correlates to changes in these, in these particular cells when um, they're, they're re-exposed to THC again in, in adulthood. So this is just a, the first part to say, we know that prenatal exposure to cannabis impacts on immune and stress system and not only um, prenatal, but also adolescent exposure. And that this does last, um, very long throughout life, and that these are related to these epigenetic mechanisms. But one thing about the family tree, and so when I was given this title, um, that is important to think about. As a scientist, I showed you, you know, that um, both prenatal and adolescent exposure can impact on adult vulnerability and have these, you know, this uh, ripple effect across life. But I said that the changes that we see are mediated by epigenetic mechanisms. And one thing about epigenetics, it, the initial definition by um, a psychologist actually in the 1940s, he saw that depending on you know, like, um, the environment that you, you were in, it could impact and change your behavior, your phenotype. But he also said that it had to be assimilated into the genome. So the question for us was, can there be cross-generational transmission on future generations with cannabis? So are subsequent generations impacted by their parents' use of, of, of cannabis? So basically, does cannabis impact the germline? So those cells that will become the sperm and, and the egg. And so here we can use our animal models again, we expose animals during adolescence, for example, to THC. They never see THC again. They grow into adulthood. They fall in love. 
they have kids, but somebody else raises their kids just in case they may not be good parents. And we look at their offspring behavior. And we can see that um, one thing I hadn't shown is that we see that um, you know, adults with adolescent THC exposure, they will self-administer more heroin, especially when stressed. And here we can see in their kids that they do show similar um, reward sensitivity and will self-administer more, more heroin. And it's just that it was their parental germline exposure. We see that there are significant changes in their how cells communicate and how the cells fire. Again, just due to their, their parents being exposed to THC when their parents were teenagers. But we also see really strong changes in epigenetic mechanisms, the tags on the DNA, and a lot of them relate to genes that are important not only for synaptic plasticity, but also certain psychiatric and neurodevelopmental disorders. But one thing I should say, you know, um, when they're exposed um, to THC or cannabis as, as teenagers or, or you know, adults, you still have, and especially the females, obviously, have the germline uh, cells of their grand, granddaughters, of their grandkids. So in order to see if this is really within the family line, we can then look into the great grandkids to see who will never ever be exposed to THC, but to see whether or not there's anything transmitted. And we were surprised to see that, yes, in their great grandkids, they, for example, showed increased sensitivity to reward and other behaviors. So the fear they're self-administering to get like um, sugar reward. So there's something, and we've been studying the sperm, so there's something that does occur that THC does get in, integrated into the germline. So how does this occur? This occurs, and this is what we've been studying, again, through epigenetic changes, and here we're studying mainly the sperm. And one thing about sperm is that the, it goes through maturity, right? And so we can see that as sperm matures, these epigenetic um, changes occur due to the um, parental and grandparent um, exposure to THC. And it's only after it matures. And I, I will, for people who want to go into detail science, I can tell them. Um, later. So we see that these epigenetic changes are occurring and they're occurring specifically um, in relation to these epigenetic um, tags. So yes, cannabis, THC, we can see impacts on the developing brain. It has a long lasting effect during life. It is it interacts with genetics, it interacts with environment, especially stressful environments, but it's mediated by epigenetic um, mechanisms. And these epigenetic mechanisms, the reason that they stay within the family is that um, they impact on the germline development and those get passed on, um, I won't go into the scientific details, those get passed on um, through the different generations. But one of the things I want to emphasize and you know, can be part of our discussion is that epigenetic mechanisms are unlike genetics, which you can't change your genetics. Epigenetic mechanisms are reversible. So even though we see these long lasting effects on anxiety and other behaviors as a consequence of developmental exposure and even cross-generational exposure, because these are epigenetic uh, mechanisms, they can be changed. So I do think that the family tree, yes, is impacted by cannabis and we can track it across generations, but it is not deterministic that this is the, the end all, be all and end all. And I'm happy that my, um, I'm ending with my mom, <laughs> who said her would have been her birthday today. You know, my 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 uh, my uh, tree is very strong from Mona style, um, who I love very much. So I'm going to stop here and take questions. As I said, I know a lot of science. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hurd. Yes, a lot of science, but you have, I think, broken it down for us to understand 
the um, importance of your research into this subject area. And we certainly thank you for the in-depth investigations that you've undertaken. You know, just listening to you, um, thinking of um, the scripture in Psalm 139 that says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And you've certainly presented to us the complexity and intricacy of the human design, but also its fragility. But it was good news at the end where you said that the epigenetic mechanisms are reversible. So change is possible and the impact of change can be introduced and then the benefit can then continue for generations. So that is that is good news indeed. Um, you know, also just listening to you and giving time for our participants to put their questions together or their comments and then to put it into the chat. You know, sometimes we often um, look at children who behave uh, what badly we'd say and we just dismiss it as being bad behavior, but really not investigating what lies behind their experience or what may be root causes and triggers. And certainly this uh, presentation um, it makes it an imperative for us to understand what exactly is happening in a child, what happened in their environment when they were in their mother's womb and what is happening at home and what they're exposed to, to try and understand and rather than just label them as bad behavior, but just to understand what exactly is happening with that child and had happened with that child. So thank you again very much, Dr. Hurd. I'm going to pick up now some of the questions in the chat, an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, question here, in one of the illustrations, cross generations in mice, you refer to heroin, but we're dealing with cannabis. Um, is there an extraction from that study into your research on cannabis? Yeah, so um, when I started studying the developmental effects of, of cannabis, one question that we're always asking was whether or not, you know, cannabis is quote unquote, this gateway drug to other drugs. And so we would look at adult animals that had adolescent exposure to THC, for example, and see whether or not they would self-administer more heroin. And invariably we saw that behavioral traits definitely made a difference in, in animals does as they do in humans, but we saw that they were more sensitive to opioids. So a question that we, that's why we wanted to see, were they um, in the cross-generational study, would they be sensitive to um, any drug? So we chose heroin um, just because they can control their self-administration of heroin much more. It's having animals self-administer ganja and cannabis is much more difficult. So that's why we wanted to see whether or not they could, you know, if they control their own intake, what would it say? Hey, thank you, thank you. Um, one participant has said, and I fully agree, simple communication of an extremely complex subject. Thank you very much. Question, does the impact pass only through the mother? So actually, the our first study was looking at both when both mom and dad were exposed. We then just continued to study only the fathers. So we've only been tracking the, the male line right now. And we do see differences in whether their kids are males or females, but it's we're studying it through the sperm just because we also conduct human studies and it's easier to study sperm in men than to study you know, the egg in women. And women are much more complex. So actually it's, um, it's the men that we've been studying and the sperm, yeah. Okay. Do you have an explanation though? Because you did cite the gender differences in the effects of THC. Do you have an explanation why this is markedly um, observed in the male versus the female? No, um, we don't. And it's not that you know females don't show anything. We do see um, females also showing, even in our in our human study, for example, um, the the girl the boys will show like again if I'm switching more aggression, and the boys show more anxiety and. Um, or sorry, the girls show more anxiety, the boys show more aggression. So it's not that girls show nothing, but a lot of the times that when we see, um, at least in the models that we have studied so far, um, the molecular changes, a lot of the brain changes are much stronger in the boys. And we, and as I said, we saw it even in the human um, fetuses, we don't know why yet. Um, and that's an important question to try to find out. 
Okay. And possibly, uh, and I'm a layman just saying, it's actually enhancing whatever is our natural disposition. So the testosterone and natural aggression in boys, perhaps, or that doesn't figure. No, but I mean, we, we see other behaviors and other molecular changes that's not related to aggression that you see, you know, um, like the immune changes that we saw, mm. for example. We see, you know, and this, and this, um, their, their endocannabinoid system is changed to a much greater extent um, in the boys than in the girls. So could it be just in terms of the, how, how much, I don't know, in terms of certain metabolic, the metabolism of THC in boys and girls, even during the fetal you know, development may change, may differ because the, the male placenta is different than the female placenta. So it could be something um, like that. So those are things that we're, we're trying to figure out. Another oh. question, sorry. Does the method of taking cannabis vary in its impact on the brain? For example, if you're smoking it or drinking it or cooking it in food? Yeah, it does. I mean, it makes a huge difference. So clearly smoking inhalation um, hits the brain faster. So, and as I mentioned, the potency that we have seen with THC today is very different um, than in the past. And you see that people are getting quote unquote addicted quicker to these high potency THC and they show much stronger effects, especially when it's smoke. But with that said, people now are putting it, then if you drink, drank it or if you had you know, edibles, but the, the edibles today, for example, have some high level THC in them. And that also is, you know, you see people have like psychotic, you know, type behaviors um, with um, eating these edibles. But normally the, the, the worst, <laughs> the, the strongest effect is going to be with smoking as compared to, you know, um, drinking and just because of the absorption in the body. And one thing I didn't mention um, during this talk is not only the potency is critical, but the type of cannabis. So one of the things that we've seen is that as the THC potency has increased, the amount of other cannabinoids such as cannabidiol, CBD, that seems to have a more protective effect that ha has been reduced. And we actually carried out some of the pioneering studies with CBD showing that it could reduce heroin craving and anxiety. So in contrast to what THC does, so it's not just how you take the cannabis, it's the type of cannabis that people are also taking that um, is, is a big problem. Thanks, I'm just wondering whether your studies and your findings have uh, weighed in on any discussion, any debate on the criminalization or decriminalization or recriminalization of the use of ganja in various states. Um, maybe you've been aware that a few years ago, uh, uh, two ounces, the use of two ounces of ganja was decriminalized in Jamaica. And there is um, effort by our current government to build up a commercial um, ganja industry and with exports to other countries. And I'm just wondering whether your studies have had any kind of um, influence on that discussion. So my studies in the U.S. are used by both those who are pro-cannabis and against cannabis. So people either hate or love me in both groups. In this, so, and they use my data because the results are results. And like I said, I showed that CBD absolutely has positive beneficial effects, but developmental effects uh, of, of cannabis are significant that we cannot ignore. So both groups have used it to you know, push their particular um, policy, uh, you know, in the US and obviously Jamaica, I mean, I don't believe that people should be imprisoned for cannabis use. In the US, they use it a lot to imprison, especially black and brown people. And, you know, for, you know, minor use, as I said, I, you know, people always tease me, you study cannabis, but you don't use cannabis yourself. And it's, and, you, you know, I, I don't think you get to, to treat a disorder and help people by imprisoning them and not giving them any help. And for me, as I said, the stress combination with the cannabis is 
a very toxic combination. So we need to think about how do we help people and how do we, do we especially help young people? And a lot of young people, they experiment because they're bored, they're not, there's, they don't have alternative things. And I think our society has indeed kind of glamorized cannabis now, also that it's a cure-all for everything. And so for me, the government in, in you know, um, I think Jamaica may be even too late to, for, um, you know, building up a, a cannabis, um, I don't know, we will see, you know, because so many co countries have developed a cannabis, um, um, you know, in, well, business. And so the business model, you know, Jamaica had the brand with, you know, obviously Bob Marley and, and, and Ganja. But I think that in order to do that, they really have to, I want medicine and education. I don't see, you know, how you, um, put out these products without making sure that people are responsible and, and for people to understand that what are they making? Are they making recreational products? Are they making medicinal products? And are they educating the public? And especially educating young people, like I said, young women, especially in pregnant women. You know, that's where our gen, and not only pregnant women, as I showed the cross-generational effects occur in the sperm as well, you know, so the men need to also be educated to realize that this is a legacy that's being passed on. How do we do this in a responsible manner? It can be done in a responsible manner, but it has to be done and people have to think about it and how it should be done. Should there then be specific campaigns as we have for showing the danger of alcohol and pregnant women have similar campaigns to say that pregnant women should be prohibited from? smoking cannabis? I think that they should be educated. Absolutely. I don't see how you can say not to make the link. Um, I mean, the data is the data. We, we see it. I will say, you know, the cross-generational effects of cannabis, it's not unique to cannabis. We know that everything, you know, things that we do in our life does get transferred to the next generation. We thought it was only going to be through genetics, but the environment, and that's why if we don't deal with the toxicity of stress, of violence, those things also get passed down. That those anxiety and and you know depression disorders. So I think I don't see how a government um, builds a business without educating in the same way as alcohol, as you said, as the same way as cigarettes, and and even more. Right, right. And yes, education. Um, uh, let me clarify myself, not that we can prohibit, <laughs> but certainly to educate and to show the dangers of doing so. Um, would you have tracked whether cannabis use increased during the two years of COVID when children uh, were at home? Cannabis use, I mean, and other substance use also increased. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it's not just, it wasn't with um, teens. I think it was mainly with adults. You saw that there was more cannabis use. Okay, okay. But in light of showing the behavioral impact from as young as three to four years, what is the projection for behavioral changes in the future among school children? And how would you envision, envisage a, a state managing that? And are we heading towards a mental health crisis? I think that we're already in a mental health crisis. This is that our society, there's a lot of, there's so much stress. A lot of the young people are dealing with violence more than ever before, you know? And obviously Jamaica is no different. I mean, probably you have, actually you have more violence in one way. I know the numbers are, are mm -hmm. working in Jamaica. How mm -hmm. do you live like that and think that you, people can be normal, that, that you can get to become a normal adult, functioning adult, when children live under such difficult circumstances mm -hmm. and when those around them are you know using cannabis and they're consuming cannabis so we know for example as i said even if we think about the stress and anxiety we know that the behaviors that we see in the children are are usually predictive of developing future psychiatric disorders so they are at risk does it mean that they will develop these disorders no but they are very much at risk. We also know that it increases 
um, especially for adolescent use, psychosis and schizophrenia. So, and especially when the potency of THC has increased. So unless I think our society takes a really strong look in the mirror at how, what we have done to protect children and what we have not done, locking children up, locking their parents up won't help. Providing education, providing outlets, providing true education of what does cannabis do to your brain, not what not just like, you know, it, these are the things and to your sperm and to your egg, these are the things that we need people to understand. This is our legacy. And so what is the legacy that you want for, for your children and your family? Right. So just picking up on some more questions here, would you say then that your investigations make a direct link between the increase in mental disease cases and the legalization of cannabis? I don't think that my studies make a direct link to the legalization of cannabis because people were using cannabis before it was um, legalized, at least in the US. Um, and even some of our earlier studies um, with the pregnant women, it, cannabis wasn't legal. And I really appreciated you know, women um, participating in our study, knowing you know, that we, we wouldn't you know, like, um, tell them, you know, we, we'd try not to stigmatize women and try to, you know, try to protect them. So, it, but we show definitely a direct link between cannabis use and the potential the, and the risk. And I emphasize risk because as I showed you, the changes that we see are mediated by these epigenetic changes and they are reversible. So again, in enriched environment, giving kids, you know, opportunities to be nurtured in ways that are positive helps to counter a number of the things. And the earlier we get to children, but it's not just children, they're not in a vacuum, they're in a family. So it's the family unit that has to be supported. I didn't talk about the postnatal environment. The postnatal environment is also critical. So if the mother, the family is not being um, nurtured themselves, it's tough to just take that child in isolation. So, you know, we can do a lot in schools, but the children are going back home. They're going back home to, you know, so to me, family, um, fam the family together, that to me is what is an important way to alleviate some of these, um, you know, potential risk that cannabis has through these epigenetic mechanisms. Definitely. The, the family and family relationships are either a, a factor for resilience or uh, for risk. Exactly. And exposure. Yes. yes. In and, terms of, yes. And I mean, the community, that's why the community is so essential. Right. In terms of making that link between the cannabis use and the risk, is that an approach that you have used or seen others use in reaching teen boys? who might say they've seen others smoking ganja all their life and there has been no negative effect. Why should I not um, right. engage? I, I want to know, like, you know, when they say they'll see no negative effect, that's usually a little bit, uh, um, a, 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 a stretch, you know, yeah. um, a, a little stretch. It comes back down to, I guess, in terms of what you want your life to be. And I do think that when people feel that they don't have any opportunities, they don't see a way out, they don't see, you know, potential for their adult lives. So that's why. So until we make our society one where everybody has opportunities, everybody has opportunities for education, and I don't mean education, everybody going to become a scientist, an education where everybody, I think everybody on the planet has brings something here, you know, in terms of whether they're great with their hands, whether they're great with, you know, what, whatever. But I think a lot of these young people feel lost. And mm. so that is the way out for them. So mm. to me, it is about our society, it is about governments that need to find a different way of how do we reprioritize our resources to build. In order to build a better future, you have to start with the kids and their families. I just don't see any other way. Yes, definitely. Partnership, though, with family, community and government and other groups, whether church or civil society groups that are involved in building community, healthy community and family relationships. Yeah. Another question, is cannabis proven to be more or less carcinogenic than cigarettes or tobacco? 
it, I, that question is again tough in the sense of so um, you have more lung cancer with cigarettes. Absolutely, you know the data shows that there. But you have other health risks with cannabis use as well, and and unfortunately also many people who smoke cannabis also smoke cigarettes. So you know that combination. But definitely when you think about you know, the classic carcinogenic effects um, that people often think about lung cancer and, and throat cancer, um, you know, you, you see more with, with cigarettes than you see with cannabis. Hmm. How about the effect on secondhand use of cannabis? Secondhand use is, you know, uh, uh, people are in, that's why I, I don't know if I, I emphasize enough in the beginning of my talk um, that one of the things with the children the exposure may not even be prenatal. It can be during childhood because of the secondhand smoke. So the CDC here in the US um, doing studies and looking at secondhand smoke, a lot of kids are in consuming a lot of cannabis due to secondhand mm -hmm. smoke. And secondhand smoke gets absorbed and goes, goes to the brain um, as well. Okay. Another question. You spoke about the link between cannabis use and a negative impact on the immune system. Is this seen only in the primary user or also in subsequent generation? So that's the, a great question. We are studying in the subsequent generation. Um, to be honest, the subsequent generation studies are very challenging. They take a very long time. And um, so I'm stopping <laughs> a lot of those studies. Um, but one of the things, since we do see these, um, these immune and stress sensitivity, we want to try one more thing and look in the, in the generations and to see, because I'm sure that um, it could account for some immune, um, in society we see many more sensitivities in, in current um, generations and that could be certain things as well. Okay. And our last question, how does a woman protect her potential her baby or from risk if the man used cannabis in his adolescent life but is not using it now during their relationship so i mean one thing is um i didn't mention so the epigenetic changes some of them that we see here like these spe specific epigenetic tags on the dna dna methylation and prenatal vitamins contain these um you know folate and those are actually um, really beneficial for dampening down, you know, um, these epigenetic um, changes. And obviously the parent that you are makes a big difference that we talk about the environment. Mm -hmm. So it's not deterministic. And that's what's important. I think, you know, we're talking about risk. And when you know your risk, just like, you know, if, you know, your, your uncle um, had an alcohol use disorder, and your aunt did as well, that you have a particular risk for that. So you try to make sure that you stay away from alcohol. It's the same thing here. It's in knowing your risk, what can you do to mitigate that? The same thing with you know certain cancers that run in family or diabetes and so on. So for me is that we need to take this as any other health uh, risk, any other disorder, any other disease. And I think that that's been the problem. We put it to, quote unquote, recreational or what, and things like that. But it's not, it's about health. Right, right. And also reducing or avoiding her own stress during pregnancy as well, taking care of herself. Exactly. Make sure you take care of yourself. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Well, Dr. Hurd, this has been really, really tremendous. So much information for us to process and think through. But again, you've helped us to connect the dots and to rethink how we, again, look at our children, investigate difficulties in this in the classroom or on the playing field and trying to understand how we can help our children to have a safe and health or ch healthier childhood but as you said it's pointing to the home the family and community so thank you thank you so much for the work that you're doing what lies ahead for you what are some future avenues for you in your research um, trying to develop treatments for addiction so we have a you know number of studies going on and as I said, CBD, cannabidiol looks, you know, potentially really promising. So um, that and uh, another um, line that we're following. So we're really optimistic that we can 
get medicine to help people. That's great. Both identifying the problem and then identifying and developing a cure, a solution, a response. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving us your time this evening, the work that you're doing. And if ever you come to Yard, come back on the rock. <laughs> Give us a shout out, please. <laughs> well, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hurd. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you have found this time well spent on a Wednesday evening. Remember, if you're not on the mailing list, please to inbox me right now with your email address so that you can be notified of upcoming lectures and do visit the Issachar Foundation Jamaica YouTube channel to view this evening's lecture. We have permission of Dr. Hurd to put this recording up on YouTube as well as our previous uh, lectures. Thank you so much and do have an excellent evening, everyone. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you.